Okay, so welcome back everyone who was here last time for the Gail Sinatra talk and uh, welcome everyone who's new. I'm here with my co-host Tanya Lombroso and our guest today. Uh, this is the Nature of Belief seminar talk series and it brings together cognitive scientists in, who are interested in the nature of belief from various different angles. Last time we talked about science denial and those sorts of beliefs. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about the nature of partisan political uh, belief differences. Um, this talk series is generously funded by the John Templeton Foundation. And we are very happy to have Matt Graham with us today as our guest. He is a PhD in political science from Yale University and he is currently a postdoc at George Washington University. And we are very happy to have him. He's doing a lot of cutting edge research. So I will pass it off to you, Matt. Let me just say first, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, let me say first that there will be time for questions at the end. And the way we'll manage that is you can type your question in the chat window and then uh, Tanya or I, uh, probably Tanya this time, will select from the questions that get typed and either she'll read them out uh, as they were typed or give you the opportunity, uh, depending upon which seems to make most sense at the time. All right, so uh, let's all welcome Matt Graham. Thank you, Neil. Um, let me get my pointer set up here. All right, hi everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you, Neil and Tanya for having me. Uh, my name is Matt Graham. Uh, like Neil said, I'm a uh, postdoc and lecturer at George Washington University. Um, and today I'd like to tell you a little bit about my work on the nature of partisan belief differences as we measure them in surveys. Uh, so it's widely known that Democrats and Republicans appear to disagree about matters of fact. And one doesn't have to look very hard in academic research or in the public sphere to read claims like, you know, one party falsely thinks that the economy is doing badly under another party, or uh, members of one political party uh, believe false things with respect to elections, or that people believe uh, crazy conspiracy theories about science and other matters. And when we see these um, apparent, uh, these partisan belief differences, um, we tend to assume that the reason that Democrats and Republicans respond differently to survey questions about matters of fact is that people actively believe the false claim that they're endorsing in surveys. But there's another possibility, which is that people don't pay very much attention to politics. Um, they tend to, uh, if they learn any political facts, they tend to learn facts that are favorable to their side. And when they don't know the answer to a factual question, they make a guess. They assume, well, my party is good and the other party is bad. And so I'm just going to assume that the answer to the factual question is whatever would benefit my side. And I'm not really sure. Um, and this is a possibility that has been systematically underexplored um, in survey research, not just in political science, but across the board. And the uh, central claim that I want to try, to try to convince all of you of today is that partisan belief differences reflect ignorance of inconvenient truths more so than acceptance of falsehoods. So people often don't know the correct answer to facts like um, trends in the unemployment rate under the other party or was the other party's president actually born in the United States, but their ignorance of these facts don't mean don't necessarily mean that they have firmly accepted the falsehood. Um, and uh, the sequence that I'm going to go through to try to convince you all of this, um, I'm first going to say a word on uh, defining and measuring beliefs, and then I'll take you through three empirical sections. Um, the first concerns the properties of don't know response options, which are the most common way of um, handling individuals' lack of confidence in their survey responses to the extent that it's handled at all. Um, and then the uh, core of the talk will examine what uh, partisan belief differences look like when we measure confidence 
and then we'll interrogate how we should interpret it when people claim um, to be very confident in a false claim that they've endorsed in a survey. Um, so I'd like to start by um, just defining what I think of when I think of the word belief. And um, I, I may have said at the beginning that uh, a few years ago, reading some uh, philosophy was very central to um, the development of this research agenda. Um, and so I, and I, know, I saw that Eric Schwitzgibel was in the audience. So in his very nice entry um, in the Stanford Encyclopedia, um, he notes that a belief is an attitude, an attitude uh, toward a propositional statement that we take to be the case or regard as true. Um, and we don't necessarily have to actively hold the belief in our mind, but it's something that we were exposed to at some point and accepted and, uh, and stored in our brain. And so as a consequence of that, it might um, end up influencing our actions or our behavior. Um, surveys tend not to measure beliefs of this kind. Um, there's some canonical work on, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that the beliefs we measure in surveys are just plucked straight out of the respondent's mind and they really think whatever it is um, that they endorsed in a multiple choice question. Um, but what survey researchers say are that survey respondents are constructed off the top of the head based on whatever you can call to mind. And so maybe you have a belief stored in there about the specific fact in question, um, but other times survey responses are based on heuristics like, I think my side is good and the other side is bad. And so I'm just gonna pick the thing that makes my side look good because I don't really know. Um, and so more formally, researchers imagine um, that the beliefs that we measure are functions of some latent probability. Um, and everything I look at is going to be uh, survey questions with two response options. Um, so you might imagine that the latent probability varies between zero and one, where one is complete confidence in the correct answer, zero is complete confidence in the incorrect answer, and one half is being completely uncertain. You might pick one response option or the other, um, but you could have just as easily um, picked the other one. And you think there's some probability that that option is true. Um, and so um, for an example of a question like this, you might ask a survey respondent, um, which of two things is more likely to be true, either that climate change is not occurring or that climate change is occurring. And when the respondent um, reads a survey question, they um, quickly call to mind whatever they know or don't know about uh, climate change and uh, form this latent belief between zero and one. But what they express depends on what response options you give them. So one fairly common practice is to force people to choose between um, two response options or uh, you know, maybe a four point scale where two of the options correspond to one and two correspond to the other. Um, some people get it wrong, some people get it right, and we say, oh, everybody whose best guess was wrong um, believes the falsehood. They hold a misperception, and everybody whose guess was right knows it. Um, but there is some dissatisfaction with uh, this way of doing things. You know, it, it might not be right to say that the, uh, the ignorant people hold a misperception or possess knowledge. And so oftentimes we use a don't know response option, and that tries to set um, some internal confidence threshold, where if you're not confident enough in your on-the-spot inference, you should say don't know, and if you are confident in it, um, then, you, uh, then you choose your best guess, and maybe it's reasonable to call that a belief. Um, and then other researchers try to go further, this is what I'll do in the second part of the talk, um, and measure people's confidence in their answer. And so not only do you have to um, make the guess, but then you also have to say you're fairly sure of that. And maybe that's sufficient to say that somebody holds um, a belief in the sense that they have actually heard and accepted the claim that they are endorsing. Um, so to measure um, beliefs of this kind, I'll give you a more specific example of the uh, types of questions I'm going to use. This is a question that I copied directly from the American National Election Studies, which is a workhorse survey in political science. Um, and so to or in order to measure misperceptions about climate change, um, the researchers ask, which statement is more likely to be true? World temperatures have risen or have not risen over the past 100 years. 
And immediately after the respondent selects their answer, a certainty scale appears right below it. Um, so they can state um, the, their confidence in their answer on a 0 0.5 to one scale from you know, not being at all confident in their answer to being completely confident. And based on this, I can either look at confidence or I can um, back out that zero to one probability that I highlighted just a moment ago. The um, question types that I'm uh, going to be examining today um, first, I'll, I'll look uh, at some economic statistics like the unemployment rate. These are kind of a uh, canonical example in my field. It's where research on partisan differences first started. Um, I'll also look at um, politicized controversies that seek to delegitimize one's political opponents, uh, such as the controversy over President Obama's birthplace. These used to be looked at as something of an oddity, but now that we're all more cognizant of the importance of democratic stability, these seem like more of a serious concern when people spread lies that uh, delegitimize one's opponents. And finally, I'll show you the most evidence about scientific controversies um, such as climate change. And I, I'll give you more evidence, uh, a little more evidence in this area um, partly because it's the best studies I've run and partly because I copied the questions directly from the American National Election Survey. Um, and so you know that these are items that are being used to uh, measure false beliefs um, out there in the world. So where I wanna start with the empirical evidence is on the nature of don't know response options. It's very easy to imagine that if you give a survey respondent the option to say, I don't know the answer to that, then if they don't know, they should say don't know. And if they give an answer, they must really believe it. But there's actually a much wider range of possibilities um, that could come out of providing a don't know response option. And so in order to better understand um, what types of beliefs are uh, measured when a don't know response option is offered, I conducted a survey experiment in which I randomly assigned the presence or absence of a don't know response option. And then anybody who answered the question, I allowed them to say how confident they were in their answers. And so the confidence levels that get filtered out give us a sense of um, how unconfident you have to be to say don't know. And so first I'll show you the distribution of confidence levels among people who did not have the option to say don't know. So we see that a fair number of people um, chose an answer but were completely unconfident in it. That's this 0 0.5, 50-50 between the two response options. You'll see that many people claim to be completely confident in their answer. Um, that's this one assigning total probability to uh, whatever option you chose. And then there are also these intermediate confidence levels. Um, and so next, I'll layer on the distribution of uh, certainty that uh, realizes when a don't know response option is allowed. And the degree to which these gray bars fail to fill up the black bars tells you what don't know options filter out. And so you can see that don't know filters out about 60% of the least certain responses. It filters out maybe 30% of these responses at low, moderate certainty levels. And it doesn't filter out uh, too many responses that would have been stated with a high level of certainty. And so this tells you that don't know response options do something useful. They do tend to filter out more responses that would be stated with less certainty, but they don't filter out all of the complete guesses and they leave a lot of uncertainty behind um, in other places as well. And so you can think of don't know response options as setting a very low confidence threshold. Um, and certainly not a high enough threshold um, to isolate individuals who would seem to really believe their answer um, in the sense of the definitions that we looked at in the beginning. And so I'm not the only person who has been dissatisfied with um, don't know response options. Um, and so myself and many other researchers have recommended that if we really want to understand um, whether 
uh, the, the false uh, claims that we're measuring in surveys are rooted in acceptance of the falsehood as opposed to ignorance of the truth, we should measure people's confidence. Um, and the, I should say that um, the results I just um, showed were uh, recently published in Public Opinion Quarterly. Um, and this, uh, the, the next part is a mix of results from my dissertation um, and a new paper that'll uh, soon come out in the American Political Science Review. So I wanna start by taking uh, certainty at face value. And what I wanna convince you of um, through a series of examples that'll make this all more concrete is that partisan belief differences primarily reflect knowledge and ignorance. And in each of the figures that I'll show you in a moment, I'm gonna highlight two key patterns. One is that claims to be certain of falsehoods are fairly uncommon. And the second one is that uh, standard practices create an illusion of knowledge of inconvenient truths. It seems like, um, say, Democrats know that unemployment was declining under Trump prior to the pandemic, or Republicans know that, or some Republicans know that uh, President Obama was born in the United States. Um, but actually, uh, pe people who, correct answers are not all created equal, if you will. So let's make these a little bit more concrete. Um, the first, uh, I'll show you a series of figures um, like this, um, with the x-axis being that 0, 1 uh, probability scale that I showed you a moment ago. Um, so a 0 corresponds to complete belief in the incorrect answer. A 1 corresponds to complete belief in the correct answer. And 0 0.5 corresponds to indifference between the two response options. And the first question I'll show you, um, I asked shortly uh, before the COVID pandemic started, um, did unemployment increase or decrease over the past year? And so at the time unemployment was declining, um, this was something that the Trump administration really hung their hat on. And so you would expect Republicans to be more likely to answer this question correctly. It's a con it was a convenient truth for them and Democrats to be less likely to answer it correctly because it was an inconvenient truth for Democrats that the economy was doing well under their political opponent. So first I'll show you the distribution of beliefs among Republicans. And what we can see here is that most of the probability mass is over here on the right hand side. So most Republicans get this question correct. And there's a fairly large spike at uh, close to one, which is what you might expect. So a lot of the Republicans who get this question right seem to know that unemployment was declining. Um, and there aren't too many Republicans claiming to be certain of the incorrect answer, which makes sense because uh, this is a fact that's convenient for their side. And so we don't expect to find false beliefs here. Next, I'm gonna overlay the distribution among Democrats. And we can see that a lot of Democrats do get this question right as well, but not, many of, not as many of them claim to be certain of the correct answer. And so this is the illusion of knowledge of inconvenient truths. If we were doing a standard survey analysis, we would say that all of these Democrats know that unemployment was going down under Trump, but they actually don't know it to the same degree. There's some hidden ignorance there. And conversely, over here on the left-hand side of the x-axis, we don't see a large spike in the percentage of Democrats claiming to believe the falsehood. Um, and so, there don't seem to be a lot, there didn't seem to be a lot of Democrats at this time who were deeply convinced that unemployment was going up under Trump. Now, maybe this isn't the area where you expect to find the firmest misperceptions. And so next we're gonna move over to the example of the climate change question that I showed you just a moment ago. Um, this is a case in which the uh, truth is congenial to, or con congenial or convenient for Democrats because the fact that climate change is occurring is more convenient to Democrats' uh, policy platform than Republicans. And so I'm gonna start um, with the party for whom the truth is convenient, the Democrats. Um, and we can see that not only do the large majority of Democrats answer this question correctly, but a pretty sizable share of those who get it right claim to be absolutely certain. So Democrats really know that the planet has been getting warmer over time. 
Next, I'll overlay the observed distribution of beliefs among Republicans. And we can see that a lot of Republicans do get this right, fewer. Uh, this, is a, this amounts to about a 20 percentage point gap in the percentage of answers that are correct, which is actually quite large in terms of the partisan belief differences that we tend to see in surveys. Um, but the typical Republican who gets this right is not nearly as confident as the typical Democrat who gets it right. Many fewer Republicans um, claim to be absolutely certain of the truth. And so again, that's the illusion of knowledge of inconvenient truths. There's more ignorance hidden behind those incorrect, those correct answers by Republicans um, than it would appear. And conversely, we don't see a big spike over here at zero. And so again, the typical incorrect answer, even by a Republican, represents ignorance. There aren't a lot of Republicans who are claiming to have accepted the idea that climate change isn't occurring. Now, it's also possible that you know, maybe this controversy wasn't current enough. Maybe it wasn't hot enough. And so another question that I asked, um, which was a much more current uh, controversy, was about, and this is also copied from the American National Election Survey, was about uh, the anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine and whether or not it is, it is a safe and effective treatment for COVID-19. Um, and this is a falsehood that was uh, promoted by right-wing political figures and uh, popular to debunk on the left. And so again, for Democrats, uh, the truth is convenient and, for, and Republicans might be inclined to believe the falsehood. And when we look at these, uh, these belief distributions, we see a lot more uncertainty across the board, which you might expect because um, hydroxychloroquine is a big issue, but it's not as big of an issue as climate change. Um, so once again, we see this illusion of knowledge of inconvenient truths where the typical Republican isn't as certain as the typical Democrat, and we don't see this large spike at one. And so again, it would be better if more people knew the answer to this, um, but we don't see a lot of evidence of confident acceptance of the falsehood. Now, finally, let's get even juicier. Let's look at the political controversy over President Obama's birthplace. Now, again, I'll start with the party for whom the truth is convenient, which is Democrats. Um, and once again, uh, not only uh, do people seem to answer correctly about inconvenient truths, um, but a lot of them uh, are very confident in their correct answer. And in our politics, there's so much attention paid to look, here's that crazy thing that the other side is saying, here's why it's wrong. And so we really learn the correct answers to the false claims um, that, uh, some, that some figure on the other side made. Now I'll overlay the distribution among Republicans. We see a really big illusion of knowledge of inconvenient truths. So many of the Republicans that would appear to know that Obama was born in the United States don't really know it, and that's not good. Um, but we don't see a lot of confident acceptance of the falsehood. Um, and so again, illusion of knowledge of inconvenient truths and claims to be certain of falsehoods are relatively rare. <laughs> Um, and so the results I just showed you, I hope will convince you that there are two main features that distinguish Democrats and Republicans beliefs about the facts. People tend to know um, truths that are convenient to their side, and they tend to be ignorant of facts that would be inconvenient to their side. But we did still see a fair number of people claiming to be certain of falsehoods, and that's not good. Um, and so what should we think of people like that? Um, and the next uh, stage that I want to go to is, um, is to interrogate the nature of claims to be certain of falsehoods. Um, and this is the primary focus of that uh, measuring misperceptions paper that I cited a moment ago. So I, what I want to try to convince you of now is that the confident belief in falsehoods is even less common than it appears because claims to be certain of falsehoods um, tend to be temporally unstable. People are making miseducated guesses on the spot more so than they are um, revealing confident acceptance of falsehoods. And so let's start with the example of that hydroxychloroquine question that I showed you a moment ago. Um, these figures are a little bit more complicated than the ones I showed you before, um, but hopefully there's a payoff to that. Um, and so um, in this case on the x-axis, I'm gonna show you the respondents level of confidence in wave one of a panel survey. 
On the y-axis, I'm going to show um, the how stable whether they uh, selected this or the the average tendency to select the same response in the second wave of a panel survey. So there are no challenges, no interventions, no corrective information, uh, no interventions of any kind or any difference in how correct and incorrect answers are treated. Just given what you said the first time, what did you say the second time? And I'm gonna put some dashed lines on here to, um, to give us a guide um, to what we might expect in different scenarios. So this horizontal line is the degree of responsibility that one would expect um, if all the all the measured confidence was just completely random noise, it's meaningless, and people have no tendency to stick with their response, even if they claim to be certain. Um, and this diagonal line is what we would expect to see if um, confidence and response stability match up exactly. Uh, and the the reason for this for these measurement choices is it allows me to com to directly compare correct answers to incorrect answers. So let's start by looking at conditional response stability among people who answer correctly. Um, the picture we get is not perfect, but it's pretty good as far as survey measurement properties. And so people who uh, correctly say that hydroxychloroquine is not a safe and effective treatment for COVID, um, but claim to be uncertain about it, only stick with their answer a bit more than you would expect by chance. And over here on the other side, People who um, say that hydroxychloroquine is not a safe and effective treatment for COVID um, and say they're certain about that really stick with their answer. And so it might be reasonable to say that people who say they were absolutely sure of this correct answer um, really believe it in some strong sense. Next, I'm gonna show the exact same calculation among respondents who answered incorrectly. And what we see is a lower level of commitment to one's response across the board. Um, so folks who state these low levels of certainty are probably just making a complete guess. And the people who state a higher level of certainty, it's not as if they um, don't assign any genuine credence to their answer. They, they do stick with their answer to some extent, but they don't stick with it to the same extent as people who really seem to know. And so to help interpret these measurement properties, what I like to do is also ask benchmark questions um, from knowledge batteries where no survey researcher would ever claim that the incorrect answers were misperceptions or based on misinformation or that they were really rooted in beliefs of any kind. And so in this particular case, I'd like to benchmark these results against a question from the General Social Survey. Um, it's part of the NSF's uh, um, sem or, uh, biannual assessment of the public science knowledge about whether or not electron whether electrons are larger or smaller than atoms. And we see very similar measurement properties here. And so people who correctly say that electrons are uh, smaller than atoms and uh, claim to be certain about it really stick with their answer. They really seem to know. Um, and people who say that they're certain that electrons are larger than atoms um, do stick with their answer to some extent. So there really is something going on in their mind that makes them think that it's plausible that electrons are larger. Um, and that, that's a, that's a semi-stable tendency across surveys, but obviously there is no political figure or science textbook or anything um, spreading misinformation about the relative size of electrons and atoms. And so what this tells me is that we should interpret claims to be certain of falsehoods as miseducated guesses. There's um, some consideration in people's minds that makes them think that it's plausible that hydroxychloroquine is a good treatment for COVID. Um, it would be better if people didn't think that that was plausible, um, but it doesn't seem at least on average to represent um, the sort of the sort of convicted or conviction um, that that we uh, tend to see in public facing summaries and academic analysis of incorrect answers to survey questions. Um, just to give you uh, one more example of um, of a question where I saw similar patterns um, is with respect to um, the apparent belief that vaccines cause autism. 
Um, this was a belief introduced to the public sphere um, by a fraudulent academic study. Um, we again see very good measurement properties among uh, people who answer correctly and um, not the worst, but not great measurement properties among people who answer incorrectly. So again, even individuals who claim in a survey to be certain that vaccines cause autism, they find it plausible, uh, but they're not representative of that archetypical person who um, is really down the misinformation hole and has firmly accepted this false claim. Now, sometimes the measurement properties aren't even this good. And so here's the climate change question that I showed you the example of before. Here we have great measurement properties among individuals who answered correctly. Um, and we have terrible measurement properties among individuals who answered incorrectly. Across the board, no matter how certain people said their answer to this question was, um, they don't have any tendency to stick with it. And so there really doesn't seem to be um, much outright denial of the idea that climate change isn't occurring. Now it's possible that if the American National Election Survey used a different question um, that tapped into measure to that uh, tapped into some other misperception, it would perform better. Um, and that's part of the upside of this work is that we can identify questions that are better or worse at measuring misperceptions. Now I want to show you um, one more set of results um, that supports what I just uh, said. Um, unbeknownst to me, at the same time that I was evaluating uh, one set of questions from the ANES, um, they were conducting a, a special survey um, called the Social Media Study. And it included um, four items that are supposed to measure uh, misinformed beliefs. The code book specifically instructs researchers to interpret it this way. Um, and this is a good test because it's a better quality sample than mine. Um, it's larger and I didn't uh, control any of the measurement choices. And so nothing that you would see here is an artifact of some mistake uh, that I made in terms of survey design. So first, when I pool across all of the questions in uh, this ANES survey, um, I see the same basic pattern um, that I showed you just a moment ago. Um, to make this more concrete, I can split it out. Um, and so they asked four questions that were supposed to tap into salient misperceptions. One of them was about, um, did the Affordable Care Act make the percentage of Americans with health insurance go up or down? So people who um, correctly said that uh, health insurance went up after the ACA really know it. Um, people who incorrectly said that um, health insurance uh, rates went down after the ACA um, might find that plausible. They might not like the Affordable Care Act, but they don't seem deeply convinced of it. Um, not to dwell too much on this, um, th this uh, deportations one um, is about the relative number of immigrants who were deported under President Obama or President Trump. Um, this is one that uh, was often used as a trump card in arguments uh, by Democrats pointing out uh, their relative enforcement records. And in this case, we don't see much stability among correct or, in or, or incorrect answers. So when the fact is obscure enough, you might not see that degree of stability in either case. Um, another one, uh, President Trump's sort of original big lie were there millions of illegal votes cast in the, 20, in the 2016 presidential election? Uh, very similar measurement properties. It's not good that these folks find it plausible that so many illegal votes were cast, um, but they don't seem on average to have accepted uh, President Trump's claim. Um, and the best uh, measurement properties that we've seen for any incorrect answer are on this ANES question about whether Russia attempted to interfere in the 2016 election. Um, and so even in this case, we see that the incorrect answers are a little less stable than the correct answers among the people who would seem to believe it most strongly, um, but it does a much better job and maybe a good enough job um, for some person's um, ultimately arbitrary preferences about uh, what threshold is sufficient to count as a belief. Um, and so this again tells us that if we do the hard work of pre-validating survey questions before we just assume that every incorrect answer and every partisan belief difference is reflective of firmly held misperceptions, 
we might be able to get to a state where we can actually distinguish misperceptions from ignorance instead of just using our theoretical expectations to see the same pattern around every corner. And so um, the implications of those results um, is that, are that even high levels of certainty don't reliably indicate belief in falsehoods. This reinforces uh, my main contention, which is that partisan differences primarily reflect knowledge of convenient truths and ignorance of inconvenient truths. Um, and they also have a significant bearing on research that claims to study misperceptions. Um, not every single piece of research, but I would say the large majority of research on misperceptions and misinformed beliefs um, their prevalence, their predictors, can we correct them? What are the consequences of correcting them? They all take for granted that misperceptions exist at baseline. And if they don't exist at baseline, then we need to reinterpret much of that evidence as describing the prevalence, correction, and consequences of political ignorance. And if we take this viewpoint that these claims to believe that, that these apparent beliefs in falsehoods and surveys um, aren't necessarily what they appear to be, um, we can start to see the path forward um, to explain some fairly puzzling results um, in the study of political misperceptions. For instance, if you're a formally minded person you would think that one of the most obvious predictions would be that the more confident somebody is in a falsehood, the harder it would be to correct that belief with corrective information. Um, but that's never been uh, shown empirically to be the case. And I think that one possible reason for this is that we haven't been careful about whether or not we're actually measuring confident belief in the falsehood in the first place. Similarly, when we try to correct misperceptions, sometimes it seems to have the expected effects on um, attitudes and behavior, and other times it seems like the, and other times there's no effect of the correction. Um, and my conjecture is that in the cases where it doesn't seem to matter, we haven't actually measured something that somebody believes to begin with. And in the cases where it does seem to matter, uh, maybe we've used a question with better measurement properties without knowing it. Um, and so uh, as I move forward with this, I'm going to try to prove those conjectures um, instead of just making them uh, conjectures. I wanna conclude um, with three larger implications. Um, and so I think what I have uh, shown here today um, tells us something about what types of information um, the American public is consuming. It's very easy to get this picture from popular media of uh, these rabid partisans who are just gobbling down misinformation and believe every single thing that they hear. I think the real picture is more like most people don't pay that much attention to politics. And when they do pay attention, they're more likely to encounter convenient facts than inconvenient facts. And so it's not as if there are no bad apples out there. You know, there really are some people um, who have lain on their deathbeds demanding hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for COVID, but that's not nearly as common as you would think it is from generalizing those anecdotes um, using surveys. And this posture can resolve um, what I think is a, is a pretty big apparent contradiction um, where it's very hard to gather data on individual level media exposure, um, but studies by uh, Andy Guest, Jonathan Nagler, Brendan Nyhan, and others um, often seem to have this, often have this tone of, wow, there's a lot less exposure to misinformation than you think. And the reason for this um, apparent disconnect between studies of media exposure and conventional wisdom is that the conventional wisdom is based on misinterpretations of survey questions. This also tells us something about democratic accountability. Um, so many scholars who have observed partisan belief differences have conjectured um, that these differences are um, reinforcing people's partisan predispositions, and maybe they're part of the reason um, that people are so locked in on their political side of things these days. The way I tend to interpret it is as missed opportunities for accountability. And so people tend to be ignorant of things that would be inconvenient for their side. Maybe if they learned those things, um, they, would, uh, they would be more likely to change their mind. 
And finally, I think the biggest picture implication of what I've shown is that this is not the only case in which measurement error creates an illusion of citizen incompetence. Um, and so I would expect that uh, many audience members in a setting like this would have heard of the Dunning-Kruger phenomenon, which is the idea that the least confident people are the most overconfident in their ability. Um, there's some nice new work that shows that this is exactly what you would expect if the confidence measure were just completely random noise. Um, and a similar in, in a related tendency, um, we tend to think that uh, people are not very aware of their own ignorance, um, that people are bad at forecasting events. Um, but across all of these research settings, um, researchers attribute error in their own measures to incompetence on the part of the subjects. And so if we spend um, some more energy on the front end trying to minimize measurement error, uh, maybe it'll turn out that people are, uh, maybe they're not perfect, um, but it's pretty amazing that mammals hurtling on a rock through space are able to do any of the things that we can do. Um, and so maybe we're not quite as uh, foolish and hopelessly incompetent as work that doesn't distinguish between measurement error and genuine problems um, would have us believe. Um, and so just to wrap up, uh, what I attempted to convince you of today um, is that partisan belief differences primarily reflect ignorance of inconvenient truths. Um, and the empirical support for this uh, was that the standard method, don't know response options, um, doesn't come close to isolating things that people believe in any meaningful sense. Um, and then the heart of the talk was that claims to confidently believe falsehoods aren't all that common and don't always mean what they appear to mean. Um, so with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. That is fascinating. And I have so many questions myself, but so do many other people in the in the uh, Zoom chat. So I want to start by bundling three related questions for you um, that came up in uh, comments from Kenny, Allen, and Ryan. And I think they're, they're thinking about other things that could explain some of these patterns of results, and in particular, whether it could be that you see some of this variability in responding because people are answering the question. They think the, the survey uh, uh, a system sort of should have asked rather than one they actually asked, right? So they're sort of answering a different question from the one that was posed, or the idea that what people are doing when they respond is really sort of some form of expressive responding, right? Where they're sharing a kind of motivational or affective reaction rather than something that we might think of as a, as a canonical belief. So I'm sure these are things that you've thought of, and I'm curious if you could sort of contextualize those ideas with respect to your own proposal. Yeah, so I, I, th um, I think the best thing I could say about this is that expressive responding um, certainly could be going on here. Um, and if it were going on here, you would expect it to um, be going on in both waves of a panel survey. Um, and so to the extent that expressive responding is happening, um, I'm probably going to overestimate the, uh, the stability of uh, belief in falsehoods uh, that that are that would be convenient for that side and overstate um, the stability of um, belief in convenient truths. And so um, I think the same general story uh, holds up if that's the case. Um, and the one reason that I am uh, fairly sure about that is that I didn't present it today, but in the paper I used um, an incentive compatible measure uh, to measure the second as the second measure of beliefs in some cases. Um, people choose the uh, people make choices between a series of lotteries um, that reveal that reveal their belief in a incentive compatible manner. There's a little bit more measurement error there, um, but I see the same basic patterns. Um, the difference being that people seem a little less committed to convenient truths. And people who endorse um, endorse a falsehood uh, that is bad for their side seem a little bit um, more stable. Thank you. Um, I'm going to invite um, uh, Jen Ho Lee, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If you're in an environment where you can uh, unmute yourself to ask your question, I'll invite yeah, you to do so. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the talk. It was super interesting. I was just one uh, thinking about this aspect of spreading of information misinformation uh, because it seems to be more prevalent when 
uh, people are given alternative hypotheses or explanations that they can use to explain uh, some phenomenon. Uh, so it's uh, what, what really matters seems to be that kind of contrast between more conventional uh, explanations and uh, some alternative ones that are being given through like some uh, media, uh, other medias or uh, authorities. So um, I, I see, I think in a lot of cases, when you asked the question to participants, it was about evaluating one single one uh, belief or a statement, but I think things can uh, change. Uh, and if, if uh, multiple hypotheses are uh, presented to participants at once and they're to, to kind of uh, distribute their confidence uh, to uh, those ones. And I think that will uh, maybe closer to what people are going through and they're being uh, uh, presented with different uh, hypotheses. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I know that in political science, um, Scott Clifford and some colleagues have done uh, work like you suggested. And I know there's uh, work been done in this vein in other fields um, where if you give somebody and if you allow somebody to choose between a false claim and an alternative explanation, as opposed to is the false claim true or false, um, but apparent belief in false claims goes down. Um, I think that uh, work like that is really valuable, and I think it highlights what we are really getting in surveys fundamentally, which is that we're getting an on-the-spot inference that people apply their considerations to. And so the fact that people endorse the falsehood um, less often when, they're, when it's uh, next to a plausible truth um, I think I think reinforces the idea that when we measure apparent belief in falsehoods, people aren't plucking something out of their brain. Um, they're just saying uh, this might be true. Um, thank you. I might invite uh, Michael Lundy to ask your question. Um, if you are in a context where you can unmute. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Uh, great talk. So my question concerns whether or not you were able to look at any individual differences as far as the stability of confidence ascriptions to the question items. For instance, if you had a participant who ascribed low confidence to a falsehood, but was surveyed later on an unrelated domain, were they consistently giving low confidence? This might suggest something about maybe the metacognitive skills of these individuals where they realize if there isn't much evidence to be found for one falsehood, they're sensitive to this fact. And they're consistently recognizing that across domains, if there isn't much of evidence available, they're not entitled to ascribe high confidence uh, to any uh, number of, of falsehoods. Just curious if you were able to look at any individual differences like that. And if so, what would you make of that? Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. Um, and some individuals do tend to be um, less confident on average than others, and um, that could either be um, because they, uh, they, they know less or because they're, they're better calibrated and they have a better sense of um, how evidence ought to translate into a survey response like that. Um, so I have, um, what I've done to look at that um, I've, I've replicated the results in a regression context with uh, respondent fixed effects um, so that I only use variation um, within people. You know, are you more or less stable when you're more or less confident? Um, the, the results tend to hold up. Um, and actually, they hold up great. I, I shouldn't say tend to, they hold up great. Um, and in general, I have another paper called Self-Awareness of Political Knowledge that shows that um, people's, that variation in confidence within person is more meaningful than variation in confidence um, between people. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, I do get a lot of questions about, um, would it be different if you looked at this type of person or that type of person? Um, and so in the science studies, I measured um, as many theoretically relevant covariates as I could think of, um, generic conspiracy belief scales, the cognitive reflection tests, um, political knowledge, um, you know, age, gender, um, the strength of political partisanship. And um, in many of those situations, uh, misperception or measured misperceptions are more common and more stable where we would expect them to. Um, the pattern never go, never fully goes away. Um, but 
what that tells me is that uh, is the problem, you can think of it as kind of like an intercept shift. Um, we have a fairly, our instincts about who is more and less likely to believe a falsehood um, tend to be pretty good. Um, we're just dramatically overstating um, the number of beliefs and falsehoods that exist at baseline. Um, since, since he was quoted early on, I think I'm going to jump to Eric Schwitz-Gable, who I've asked to unmute. Eric, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, so I was interested in how much you think this translates into personal behavior. So um, it's one thing to answer survey questions. Um, it's another thing to live it in your practical life. So. I thought you know vaccines would be a pretty obvious case of this, although there might be lots of other cases too, right? Would you expect, would it be a prediction of your view that um, people who would tend to express negative opinions about vaccines that are false would tend to be less stable over time in their personal choices about whether to get vaccinated and more likely to be able to uh, change those choices under you know conditions of new information or new kinds of social pressures then people who on the converse side you know this maybe express positive opinions about vaccines would they then be more stable in their positive opinion uh about about uh getting vaccinated and getting boosters uh over time as information changes and as uh the social pressures change yeah that's a great question um so what I would say is, at least to the degree that these vaccine autism results um, generalize to uh, misperceptions about the uh, about the COVID vaccine, which is so salient right now, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, I do think that I think what the results uh, suggest is uh, something like what you're suggesting, which is that uh, people who um, don't get the vaccine. Um, in a lot of cases, they might they might have like a, ge a general suspicion of the vac of vaccines. Um, you know, they, they might they might be suspicious of the medical establishment, and we we would maybe uh, like that not to be the case. Um, but you would think that uh, a person like that who's just sort of generally suspicious and doesn't know a lot um, would be more easily persuaded um, to uh, to get a vaccine. Um, if they can be reached by that information. And um, I wish I could remember the author, um, but a, a month or so ago in uh, the New York Times, there, there was uh, there's an author who was characterizing a series of public comments about vaccine skepticism. And uh, you know, relative to the conventional wisdom, that person was struck by how many people say, you know, I'm just not sure, I heard this, I don't know whether to believe that. Um, you know, I, I haven't had time to do the research. Um, and so I, I think that when we result, we look at results like these, um, we should think that the challenge um, for something like vaccine uptake is ignorance and reaching people. You know, there definitely are uh, really dug in vaccine skeptics who believe all the misinformation and um, aren't going to be aren't going to be very difficult to persuade. Uh, but a much larger share of the population than conventional wisdom suggests um, is probably open to it um, if they could be reached with more accurate information. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to co-opt a question of Dan McGee's because it's related to something that I was hoping to ask you about. Um, you said something really striking, which is that you don't see the sort of systematic relationship between certainty and belief revision that you might expect, um, at least as, as certainty is typically measured. And what uh, what Dan points out is that if low certainty reflects ignorance as opposed to a way of avoiding a commitment to the inconvenient truth, then you might expect to see um, uh, that in addition to low stability, people are going to be more persuadable by informational interventions because it's not that they're avoiding a commitment, right? It's that they're they're actually ignorant. And so I'm hoping you can speak more to that general relationship between what it is that's being measured here and susceptibility to belief revision in light of evidence. Yeah, I think I think that is what you would think if um, if if ignorance indicates ignorance rather than avoiding a commitment. 
Um, and so I, when I, when I make these claims, uh, what I'm really thinking of is, um, are the people who appear to be certain, uh, genuinely certain of the false claim? I, I think in, in some cases, uh, people probably really are, um, but using most, uh, you, you know, using most standard survey questions I can uh, come up with to use, uh, people who claim to be certain of the falsehood aren't genuinely convinced. Um, and they and in many cases, they're somewhere closer uh, to being ignorant of the fact in question. Um, so, so I think the instinct is right. I think, and I think the measurement problem is uh, located more so on the certain end of the scale rather than the uncertain end of the scale. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping we can squeeze in three more questions. We'll see. We'll see how we go because we only have a few minutes. I'm going to encourage everyone to be succinct, but I'm hoping um, Juan Pinedos Glasscock, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, hey, sorry. Uh, great talk. Uh, to make it brief. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about the factors that played a role in the stability of belief. So it seems like both confidence and truth played a role. And I was wondering if you had any ideas about what kind of factors may have led the people who changed their confidence um, as to their, the questions, whether the environment that they were in uh, was one of the factors. I mean, the epistemic environment related to the last question, whether they were likely to encounter um, correct information and then whether you would take that environment into account into uh, being a factor at determining whether somebody has a belief or not, um, since depending on what environment they might find themselves in, their uh, confidence might be more stable. Yeah, so I think that speaks to this is like one of the uh, oldest and most fundamental concerns about responsibility, which is, are people less stable um, because th their beliefs change between the surveys? And you might imagine that if uh, people are more likely to encounter correct than incorrect information, then maybe the incorrect answers are a, are a consequence of that. Um, and so I'm not too worried about that because I uh, don't see um, systematic changes. So I always look, um, is the distribution of beliefs stable? And I don't see more people answering correctly on average. Um, with that incentive compatible measure I mentioned, I've uh, measured belief twice in the same survey and found the same pattern. So no opportunity for uh, between survey change um, in that case. And there is one more possible test of this that I haven't done, um, which is to use a three wave panel. And if the correlation between wave one and wave three is the same as between wave two and wave three, um, then it's reasonable to infer uh, that the instability is a function of how the person answers rather than change in beliefs. Um, so uh, hope, hopefully uh, things will turn out the same uh, when I do it that way too. Thank you. Neat, I wanna see those results. <laughs> um, uh, so I was going to go to Andrew, but he just, Dropped off my screen. Andrew, there you are, Andrew. I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask your question. This is um, Andrew Chignall. Okay, hi. Sorry. Um, yeah, I lost it for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, just thank, thanks for the talk. Just a simple clarification question. It seemed like sometimes certainty was referring to like the degree of confidence in the moment, and sometimes it was more about stability over time or resilience or something like that. And I just wondered if that always goes together in these people who are like wrong, but about, about inconvenient truths. But, you know, you kept saying they're not deeply convinced. And I wasn't sure if that was degree of confidence, stability over time, or usually both. Um, yeah, I guess uh, what I mean is uh, that the degree of confidence doesn't indicate uh, being deeply convinced and um, stability is the indicator of that. Um, uh, I probably okay. shouldn't have used the word deeply convinced so often. Uh, this is me switching between uh, leaning on characterizations of the language that's common in political science and communication research um, and, and trying to uh, contrast it to uh, definitions of belief from uh, philosophy. Okay, because you could be feeling very convinced at a moment and then, but you know, not in a stable way, sort of going back and forth. And 
that feels like yeah. that might be what some of those people feel in some in some way. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think that because uh, you know people don't spend that long on their answers to survey questions, um, and that's true in my data, and that's true in every other uh, survey you've ever looked at. And so, if you don't think of something for very long. Um, you could arrive at, a, at a, a, a fleeting inference that you feel very confident in, um, but then you make a completely different inference if you right. um, are asked to make the same inference for 20 seconds again, uh, two months later. Um, and I, in the paper, I use uh, examples of respondents um, open-ended comments on their answer. Um, to make the case that uh, substantively, that's probably a lot of what's going on. Um, we're almost out of time. Cool, I'm gonna thanks. Have, uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, our last question, I think, is going to be Eric Mandelbaum, who I'll ask to unmute. And I just want to flag that there's been some interesting discussion in the chat for those of you who haven't been able to follow it. And Matt will save it and share it with you because I'm sure you can't be answering awesome. and following that at the same time. But I appreciate the, um, the additional comments and really interesting questions people have raised. And I'm sorry we're not going to get to them. But I'll let um, Eric get his last brief question. Thanks. I loved everybody's questions. Really uh, good talk, but really excellent Q&A. Uh, Evan just asked a version of this, so I'll say it. Uh, really quickly, I wonder how much um, for this infrastructure you're getting content specific effects. So you're asking about questions where um, they're they're very similar to questions um, where we wouldn't expect the participants to have uh, stored answers, as opposed to questions like um, what's the capital of New Jersey, or is Kentucky the capital of New Jersey, or um, questions about whether there's a highest prime number. Ones where we could have a pretty high or low pre uh, intuitive confidence of, of what people will say. And my at least intuition there is that you're not going to see um, similar things because in one of these cases you're drawing on a stored representation, and in the cases you're looking at, what you're pointing out is that a lot of these people don't have any stored representation. So on the one hand, what you're saying about belief is a little, you know, going back and forth between those. But what I'd like you to, if you have any data or speculate on, is whether you think that the low confidence people would continue to be uh, low stability for a question like, is there a highest prime number? Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I would, I mean, what I try to do is pick benchmark questions that um, were, that everyone thinks measure knowledge, um, but are otherwise similar. And so I think there's a whole nother suite of, uh, of questions that one could look for this um, phenomenon on. And I do think that it would be content specific in that um, you have to think that there is, is something in the person's mind or some feature of the question that could cause them uh, to make uh, the same inference with some degree of consistency over time. Um, I'm inclined to think that at least in some cases, you would see similar patterns as my uh, benchmark questions. For instance, my wife and I are from North Carolina. She has this North Carolina earrings, um, and people always ask her, "Oh, is that Kentucky?" Um, and you know, so those people probably have some uh, moderately stable tendency um, to uh, think it's Kentucky, but in some cases, they might guess that it's Virginia or North Carolina instead. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Please join me in uh, thanking our speaker. Um, and thank you all of you for excellent questions and discussion. And I wanna just end by reminding everybody that this is one talk in an ongoing series that will span um, the full academic year. And our next talk is actually just a week from today. And I've posted the link to that in the chat and I encourage all of you to join us.